So we're in the middle of a, a series called Summer at the Lake, where we're looking at different stories around the, the Sea of Galilee that involve Jesus and his disciples. And we, we've talked about the idea that Jesus had spent a lot of time and did a lot of ministry around that lake. This morning we're going to look at a miracle that Jesus performs near the lake in chapter 6 uh, of John. Um, and in his gospel, John calls the miracles of Jesus, he calls them signs. And just like uh, billboards along the interstate, the signs are intended to direct you to something else. They're intended to take you to another place. In other words, the miracles of Jesus are not the final destination. There are signs that are meant to give us greater clarity about the identity and the mission of Jesus. So inside the story, there is a symbol. Great advertising will often contain a message inside, right? There are some logo designs, for example, that contain hidden uh, symbols or a hidden message that you may or may not have seen. Some of these I wasn't familiar with. But let me give you some examples. First, FedEx. Has anybody ever noticed the arrow in FedEx between the E and the X? I can't unsee it now that I've seen it, but I remember the first time I was in college, the first time I saw that, and it just blew my mind. But FedEx wants you to know that they're always moving forward, so they stuck that arrow in. What about Hershey Kisses? Have you ever noticed this? Between the K and the I, if you turn your head sideways, there's a Hershey Kiss there. I had never seen that. What about Tostitos, the chip brand? The T and the I, two people with a bowl of salsa. Baskin Robbins, this one surprised me. There is a 31 in the B and the R for the 31 flavors. And then finally, Amazon. Most of you have probably seen the smile, but do you notice that the smile goes from A to Z, showing that they carry pretty much everything that you could think of. Inside these logos, there are messages, and inside the sign that Jesus performs in our lake story for today, there is a message for us. So let's look together first at John 6, 1 through 4, to kind of set the stage for our story. It says, After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following Him because they saw the signs that He was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So go ahead and put the, the map up. Jesus used Capernaum as his headquarters, and he went around the villages and the towns of Galilee, healing all kinds of people. Capernaum is up there on the top left-hand side of the lake. Now, we talked last week about the Decapolis that's on the bottom right, but in this story, he's going to be at the top right of the lake. Um, but again, he went around the towns of Galilee, healing all kinds of people, casting out demons, teaching about the kingdom of God, and drawing a massive level of popularity. So much so that he retreated to the other side of the lake often to get away from the crowds. The crowd that followed Jesus had become so large that Jesus and his disciples got in a boat to cross over the lake. And while in John's gospel it doesn't really spell out where they went, when you look at this story in the other gospels, it's probable that Jesus was sailing from the western shore of Galilee to the eastern shore, but there in the north. The larger population of Jews were located there in the western side of the sea. Tiberias, Nazareth, and other cities were on this western shore. But if you wanted to retreat, again, you would cross over to the eastern side of Galilee where it was much more rural, rural and less populated. So the lake story that we're looking at today probably took place somewhere around Bethsaida there at the very top right-hand side of the lake um, on that northeastern shore. This was the hometown of Jesus, three of Jesus' disciples. Peter, Andrew, and Philip were from here. Jesus went there to get away from the massive crowd, but as we saw in the text as we began our story this morning, the crowd followed him. And as they're sailing along the sea to get there, you could 
guess that, that Jesus and the other disciples more than likely saw this massive crowd walking around the, the shoreline. Let's go back to verse 1 there, though. It says, again, it says, After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. John makes note there in verse 1 that it was the Sea of Galilee, but it was also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And to us, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But to his readers, uh, it was uh, something that they wouldn't have overlooked so quickly. The two names actually tell the story of tension that was going on in the area at this time. The Sea of Galilee had come to be known as the Sea of Tiberias because of a city that had been built along the coast. It was built, uh, the city of Tiberias, which that is a, a bust of the Roman emperor Tiberius. It was built around 15 AD by Herod Antipas, and he was a puppet ruler of Rome, or that Rome had appointed over uh, to govern the, the area of Galilee. And he named this new city Tiberius in honor of the current Roman emperor. And he made the city a capital of Galilee. It had been built by Herod as the symbol of power, of strength, of economic success, and high social status. So the rich, the influential, that embraced the presence of Rome in this area and the vision uh, of, of this, they called this the lake. They called it the Sea of Tiberias instead of Galilee. But it was a city, however, that had been built at the expense of those who were simple folks without influence, without political position. These others clung to the name Sea of Galilee. They were the fishermen. They were the ones that, that uh, survived on the fish of the sea. They had always lived there. They had seen so many dictators, so many exploiters come and go. And here was Tiberius. And it wasn't their city at all. It was a city for the political and uh, elite and the rich. These were the poor fishing population of the Sea of Galilee. And they put their hopes in a Messiah that would come and change what no other ruler over the decades had ever been able to do or wanted to do. So this is the sort of people that Jesus and the disciples see following them around the lake as they cross over the lake in a boat. Simple people, full of expectation. About 5,000 of them, and we'll discover that later in the text, but also we realize that that was 5,000 men, and the women and children weren't counted in that. So it could be anywhere from fifteen to 20,000 people walking along the shores. They were hungry. They were hungry in a very real physical way, but they were hungry for the smallest rights of human existence as well. They followed Jesus because their stomachs were growling. They needed deliverance. They want to be a people, their own people, not beggars that survive on Herod's handout. When Herod Antipas, when he would sense that a possible revolt was brewing, he would set up a distribution center around the area to give out free bread. But these people wanted more. They wanted legitimacy. They wanted restoration. To be a nation with their own king, a sovereign who represents them, not a foreign emperor. Dreams and visions of a Messiah were popular among the masses. Dreams of another deliverer like Moses who set the people free. Another prophet like Elisha who will fill their empty stomachs. So by the time that Jesus gets to the far shore of Galilee, the crowd's not far behind. We'll pick up in verses 5 and 6. It says, So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. You see, the, this miracle of Jesus is the only one that is actually recorded in all four Gospels. It's the most often told story about Jesus in the New Testament. We find out from Mark's Gospel that Jesus was moved with compassion when he looked upon these people. It says that they were like sheep without a shepherd. It was compassion that moved Jesus to action here. We've been in this sort of conversation with, with Jesus ourselves, haven't we? 
We hear Him say that we're to go out of our way and to care for the least of these and to meet the needs of those around us. We've seen Jesus model this compassionate way of living and we actually admire this. But in our best moments, we even aspire to this. But then we look again at the hillside crowded with such aching and we shake our heads at all the growling stomachs, the groaning hearts in the world and we're overwhelmed by the sheer number of hurting and hungry people about us. We don't know what to do when we lift our eyes and we see the massive need on the hillsides of life. But Jesus isn't overwhelmed. When Jesus asked Philip the question in verse 5, please understand that Jesus was not perplexed. He knew exactly what He was going to do. It's not like Jesus didn't have an answer to this question. He's testing Philip. We typically have a negative perception of testing. But think of it in these terms. How do you get a degree by going through tests? How do you uh, get your driver's license? You have to take a test, both written and road. No test, no driver's license. No test, no degree. In terms of God's kingdom, no test, no testimony. You don't have to, if you don't have a testimony about what God is doing in your life because you come to church. That's not where you get your testimony. You have a testimony because you have been tested. God's testing all of us like a great teacher. Actually, in the King James Version of this section, in verses 5 and 6, it reads this way. It says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. It says to prove him. This is a proving ground for Philip. Proving ground is a, is a name for a military installation where weapons, technology, and tactics are tested. This mountain is a proving ground for Philip. And the Bible is full of those proving grounds. In the Old Testament, Mount Moriah is the proving ground where God is going to test the faith of Abraham by asking him to sacrifice Isaac. The fiery furnace is a proving ground for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For two full years, an Egyptian dungeon was the proving ground for Joseph. This proving ground for Philip and the disciples. Here is the thing. Proving grounds are not only a place where we prove ourselves to God. More importantly, there are places where God can prove Himself to us. So again, Jesus is not perplexed when he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He already had in mind what he was going to do. He's going to prove himself to Philip and to the disciples once again. I'm not sure that Philip passes this test. But let's continue reading verses 7 through 9. It says, Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? You see, it's clear that Philip reaches for the usual kind of category and expectations. He begins to calculate how much money they need to buy supper for all these people. He's logical. He begins to work out the logistics. And he's basically saying half a year's worth of paychecks aren't enough to do this. Our budget just isn't big enough. Our resources are too few. In other words, he did the math. His calculations were right. They were flawless. But his formula was what was flawed. He left God out of the equation. Andrew looked at what was immediately available as a solution. What was available is the lunch of a boy who is clearly not a power broker, clearly not someone with rank, because barley flour is the flour of the poor and the flour that the poor used in their loaves, not what rich people used. It's the little detail that only John mentions. So basically, we have five granola bars and two sardines, if you want to put it in our terms. There's more symbolism at play, though. 
5 plus 2 equals 7. 7 is considered by Jews to be a perfect number. The Apostle Paul was told by God, My power is made perfect in weakness. So there's a little bit of play on, on numbers there as well. Philip was saying, What I can do is insufficient and inadequate. Andrew was saying, What I have is insufficient and inadequate. But it was an appropriate attitude. Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. If God's going to use us to help feed hungry people, to help meet the deep needs of the people around us, our starting point has to be, I can't do this. Jesus responds to our inadequacy by saying, just give me what you have. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, Stop staring at the crowd. Go look at your loaves. How many do you have? Any answer will do. Now follow the leader. Take what you have, whatever you have. Take it into your hands and hold it lightly, very lightly. Then bless it. Thank God for what you have and make it holy by giving it away for love. Then break it. Sorry, but you don't have to tear it, or, but you have to tear it up to share it. There is no way to keep it all in one piece. And finally, give it to whoever is standing in front of you, beside you, spread it around, and never mind that there does not seem to be enough for everyone. It is not up to you to feed the whole crowd, to solve the whole problem, or to fix the whole world. It is up to you just to share what you have got, to feed whatever big or little hunger that happens to be standing right in front of you. The rest will come, because God is God, the rest will come. For now, for your part, how many loaves have you? Go and see. In a real and practical way, we have an opportunity to help one of our own community members who lost everything this past week. As I mentioned earlier, I'm sure most of you are aware that Mike and Raylene Castillo, their house burned last, this past Sunday. And again, there's a benefit dinner for them at the school today. But they're also accepting donations of clothing and other personal items. And while there is a deeper meaning to our story that we will talk about in just a minute from the lake this morning, there's one thing that we can take from it as well, is that helping to meet the needs of people around us in our community is something that we should be doing. So if you have any means of helping, please do so. Continuing on in our story, verses 10 through 13, it says, Jesus said, Have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, He distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, He told His disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. There was more left over than they had to begin with. The way that John tells this story, though, it's clear that Jesus is the one who can end real hunger of every sort, not just the kind that makes a growling stomach. You notice in verse 11 that it's Jesus who is the host of the meal. He's the one who distributes the food. And there it is. That's our hidden message. That's our symbol within the sign. This was not about feeding a crowd on a hillside with bread that would only leave them hungry again. There's deeper reality to be found within this story. And here's the hidden message. That Jesus is the bread that will satisfy our deepest hunger so that we will never be hungry again. If you look at John 6, 33-34, later in this chapter, it says, For the bread of God is the one who comes down from the Father. I'm sorry, this would be 33-35, not 34. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever 
be thirsty again. We live as hungry people in a hungry world. Everyone is looking for something that will sustain and nourish life, something that will feed and energize, something that will fill and satisfy. Everyone is looking for bread. The problem is not that we're hungry. It's the kind of bread that we choose to eat. What are you hungry for? What are you really hungry for? What's the response to that question? Or sorry, whatever you respond to that question with, God cares about your answer. God cares about your hunger. He cares about whatever it is that you're longing for, hunting for, hoping for. God knows you're hungry. He knows and He cares about that hunger. So God gives us bread from heaven. Can I show you one final hidden message in the story? It's there in verse 12. You're going to look back at it. It says, When they were full, He told His disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. The deeper message is, There in the phrase, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. The phrase, let nothing be wasted, can also be translated as let nothing perish. I like that thought because Jesus' real purpose in all of this is to keep things from perishing, to keep us from perishing. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, In this way, He gave His one and only Son that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Are you hungry this morning? God knows and God loves you, so God sent His Son. Jesus is the bread from heaven. He was broken on a cross. He was given to you so that you...